And hello everyone, uh, we started the recording here for this session, our ninth session in the International Perspectives on Corpus Technology for Language Learning series organized in conjunction with University of Queensland and the State University of Sao Paulo in Brazil, as well as our wonderful European partners who have uh, made great contributions to this series. And we have another such contribution tonight from Professor Alex Bolton at the University of Lorraine, who's going to be presenting his take on uh, data-driven learning research design and something, some areas of interest that we'd like to see research from in the future. So do check that out. Uh, just before we begin, we're just going to, uh, as we always do uh, with these uh, sessions, uh, as an Australian university, it's whenever we have any kind of public seminar, uh, which is the case here, we will perform an acknowledgement of country in which the University of Queensland acknowledges the traditional owners and their custodianship of the lands on which we meet. We pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. And we recognize their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. So speaking of valuable contributions, we have with us this evening, Professor Alex Bolton, who is a well-known researcher, professor of English and Applied Linguistics at the University of Lorraine and director of the research group, uh, Analyse et Traitement Informatique de la Langue Française, uh, which I hope I pronounce correctly. His particular research interests focus on corpus linguistics and potential uses for ordinary teachers and learners in the form of data-driven learning, which I think is the majority of our audience in these sessions uh, that we've had. He's published and edited books and papers in these fields over the years and is on various boards and committees, including Teaching and Language Corpora and the editor of the journal Recall. So um, not only that, but he's, he's an awesome chap and we're very honored to have him. <laughs> so um, without kind of any further Embarrassment, I guess, was the was the term we're going to uh, welcome Professor Bolton. So I'm just going to stop sharing my screen here. And then Alex, if you're ready to share your screen, then we can begin. Okay. Um. <clears throat> This is the test always. It's a bit slow to connect. It is a little, but I think- Can you see the screen? It. Yeah, we're all good. Okay, splendid. Well, thank you very much, Peter, for that introduction, which makes me laugh as uh, so, so often happens. And um, good to see so many people here today. There are some faces that I, and names I know, I can see James, uh, his photograph staring at me there, but other people as well. And lots of names I don't know too, which is nice. Um, if the if I go straight to the um, abstract, this is what was posted online. So it says it begins following on from the opening talk, is DDL dead, long live DDL. So I'm not necessarily going to say much that's really, really new. I'm going to be continuing what Peter said, partly because we wrote a chapter for a book recently, I'll talk about that. Um, but I want to focus on fairly long-term view, last 30 years, and syntheses which have been produced, including um, a couple from me, and one in particular, looking at research design and methodology, and where we can go from there. So if you've heard me recently, there won't necessarily be a huge amount that's uh, really new here, um, but I'll do my best. Okay, fairly standard structure, beginning with I, introduction from Imrad. What is data-driven learning? Well, I like a broad and fuzzy definition, such as Guide to Energy de Cain, Sylvie Anne using the tools and techniques of corpus linguistics for pedagogical purposes. That means by learners of a foreign or second language, <clears throat> more or less directly, either using a concordancer or prepared materials. So that's basically what I <clears throat> understand by DDL. So I'm open to quite a lot of things here, which not everybody might agree is DDL. Um, 
if you go back to the original definitions by Tim Johns, who was the first person to coin the, the phrase um, DDL, he wanted to cut out the middleman in those sexist days, i.e. the teacher, cut out the middleman as far as possible and give the learner direct access to the data. Now, in a foreign language situation, if you go back 30 years, the only contact you had with a foreign language would have been in class with the teacher and the course book. Possibly you had a language resource center, but not much more. So times have changed in 30 years. Obviously, we, everybody now has access to the internet. So direct access to the data, i.e. the language, is not a rare phenomenon anymore. But there's a kind of philosophical underpinning as well. What he wants to do was to move away from being taught by the teacher or the course book towards learning, being a more active participant, and not just learning incidentally when you happen to see something, but trying to systematize that learning a little bit. And that's where I think data-driven learning is still relevant today. <coughs> now, I won't go into all the background about data-driven learning because you've had several talks on it recently, but there are all kinds of reassuring buzzwords which are connected with it, things like um, salience and noticing and sensitization. All these things are really good arguments in favor of DDL. Won't dwell on that. So DDL is to people like me, wonderful. I think it's splendid and we have lots of arguments to support it. But on the other hand, some people think it's rubbish and they may have uh, lots of counter arguments go the other way, which I'm not going to list, but you can think of some. It's claimed to be time consuming. It involves technology, which might be tricky and other things as well. Um, so this brings us to a problem. How do we actually decide if something is worth pursuing or not? Well, John Hattie, this is a quote I've used many times before because I think it really says exactly what I want to say. In a meta-analysis of meta-analyses in education, he says, everything seems to work. In other words, if you're a teacher and you teach something, students will learn something. There's always some learning that will happen unless they fall asleep or uh, don't come to class at all. So. And it, so if everything works to an extent, any body can produce a paper which supports something. So any teacher can find some support to justify all their actions. But, and this is the crucial part, the variability about what works is enormous. Not all teaching is equal. All teaching will have an effect, but not all teaching is equally effective. <coughs> so where do we go from here? Well, this is where we come to the topic of syntheses and uh, trying to make sense of a large body of research. And Luke Plonsky and Sin Wong Chong have got a pre-publication version of a paper online at the moment, which you can find, a typology of secondary research in applied linguistics. You've got at the top literature review, and it divides into two branches, traditional, which is non-systematic. And this is what you find in the introduction to any academic paper. There's always a review of the literature when it's a few papers which happen to support what you want to say or which you choose because you want to criticize them to identify your gap, your niche, and how to fill it. So um, Chung and Plonsky, they looked at lots and lots of syntheses in second language or applied linguistics, various criteria which they applied, and they came up with a list of 13 different types of research synthesis. So it's quite a rich field and a varied field, but the two real criteria which we're most people are familiar with are qualitative and quantitative. And that's what I want to divide into uh, to begin with. So in data-driven learning, there have been quite a lot of syntheses. This is by no means an exhaustive list, and I've included quite a lot of my own because I want to criticize them. So a qualitative research synthesis of DDL, this is one with Henry, Henry Tai in 2013, looking at 116 studies. There he is, there's the man. And that's what a, a narrative synthesis looks like, it's text which has its advantages and disadvantages. Um, an advantage is it's wide ranging. You can include what you want to do. It's very rich. You can go into a lot of depth, but the disadvantage is you have to, you can't include all the studies. So there's an element of cherry picking in there and you can't discuss every study in detail. So you subjectively choose which studies and which bits of which studies you want to talk about, which is perhaps the downside. Um, quantitative, uh, syntheses. These are basically meta-analyses in most cases. So here's one with Tom Cobb, which came out four years ago. There he is as Tom Cobb and published in Language Learning. It's available open access now after two or three years, I think. So you should be able to find it online. And our questions were to see if data-driven learning works, how well it works, and where it works or doesn't work. So we had, um, those were the three research questions. Now, the advantage of a meta-analysis is it's quantitative. 
it's rigorous, you have lots of criteria and you do lots of clever things with it, and you put all that quantitative information together. Um, so you average out for a lot of studies. It's not just one study, you're putting all that quantitative data together, which is a really useful thing to do. But disadvantages, it's quantitative. So it's not in itself a good thing or a bad thing. The, bad, the downside is it's less inclusive because you can only include quantitative studies. And also, even though you're trying to be rigorous, there are still decisions to be made. And um, some of those decisions involve an element of subjectivity. Somebody else trying to do the same thing would not have the same studies or analyze them in the same way. And less nuanced as well, because you can't have that, you can only look at the numerical data. You can't give a real appreciation, which you can in a narrative synthesis. But just to say briefly, what did we find? Well, if we compare our results with these are what uh, Plonsky and Oswald found in their study in 2014, they collected all the meta-analyses they could find in uh, second language acquisition, um, separating CE, that's uh, control group, experimental group, and PP, that's pre-test, post-test designs. They're very different designs. So they got the, um, the effect size from each of these studies, they divided them into four blocks, the first 25%, the second 25%, the third and the fourth, okay? And they called their first quartile a large effect. In other words, if you compare and control experimental group design, if your effect size is 0.9, you consider it as large. It's in the top 25% of all meta-analyses um, in applied linguistics. So that's what we wanted to find with ours. Um, ideally, we'd have a large effect size for both control experimental designs and pre-post-test designs. And we did. Ta-da! Amazing! Splendid! Very happy about that. So DDL produces large effects, DDL good, end of story, everybody go home. Okay, I hope you enjoyed my talk today. That's it from me. Well, no, obviously not. It's more complicated than that. You can't get the entire picture from one number or two numbers. Language learning is more complicated than that. Here's one reason why it's complicated. You've got on the x-axis here the effect size between zero, possibly minus, up to three, what we decide is the cutoff point. The red line is the average, is the mean. But each individual square or lozenge, depending on how you look at it, is an individual study. So some studies have a higher effect size, some studies have a lower effect size. Why? Where does the variation come from? And that's the key point. Where does the variation come from? Not all the studies do uh, find the same thing. Well, you can look at moderator variables. In other words, you might decide, is it the type of technology involved? If you have two or three or four groups of different types of studies with different technology, do you find different average effect sizes? Or it might be um, the type of interaction. Is it hands-on or is it on paper? But what we found was that DDL works pretty well in almost any context where it has been extensively tried, which is crucial, where it has been extensively tried. If you just have two or three studies, they might be happen to be coincidentally at the high end or the low end. But anything where we had at least 10 studies, we found a, a high intermediate or a large effect size. But if it does work almost everywhere, it still doesn't explain the variation. So a meta-analysis is useful, but it doesn't have all the answers. Okay, and then you have a third group, which is kind of oddities, different types of uh, uh, synthesis. And the one I want to look at mostly today is one with um, Nina Vyatkina. And here she is. And this is a paper which came out in October last month in Language Learning and Technology. It's free online. Um, the complete data set is also available by IRS if you're interested. Now we had three research questions. The first one was, how has the publication scope changed over time? Okay, so looking at what people are trying to do with data-driven learning over a 30-year period. That was the time period we had. Second question is what themes for future research directions were identified. And for, to do that, we looked at the um, conclusion section to see what people identified as limitations and recommendations for the future. So we actually made a corpus of the conclusion sections. And we're using that. And then third question is were those recommendations followed up in future papers? Okay, so that's the basic thing I'm going to be talking about today. Methodology, I'll go through this very quickly. It's in the paper if you're interested. Um, because, as I said, we wanted to create a, a corpus, we could only really focus on one language, which was, for obvious reasons, English, but it means there's lots of other research which is published in other languages, which is not included here. Um, also, we included the major publication types, journal articles, book chapters, pr proceedings, but we didn't include dissertations because they would have been too long and they would bias the corpus. 
and we needed a complete text so we couldn't include slides, for example. We particularly wanted to look at empirical studies which evaluate some aspect of DDL, not just outcomes, but also what learners do with it or what they think of it. So it's quite broad ranging. We were lucky enough to have a, a graduate student, uh, Jacob, who helped us with the part of the collection. Um, I won't go through that there, but the idea was to be as rigorous as possible, but we still don't claim exhaustivity because there will be other studies which we've missed for whatever reason. But we hope to have, have a, a near exhaustive collection of studies, probably something like 80% of studies which respond to our inclusion criteria. In the analysis itself, there were four things. The first thing was to do a fairly traditional uh, coding. So for this, each study has its own line. And this is just a, a sample of the first 20 papers. You can see the numbers one to 20 down the right-hand side, sorry, left-hand side. Um, a lot of empty cells for various things which just not applicable for any particular paper. But you can see there's quite a lot going on there. We have many more than 20 studies in total. So that was the first thing, to read all the papers and code them. The second thing, we, because we were interested in changes over time, we had to divide into uh, time blocks. Well, that would depend on the papers we found in every given period. So we couldn't decide in advance what the time blocks would be. We were not interested in quality. Now, this is a big question. People always often wonder about this. We wanted to be inclusive and try to get all the papers that we could, which corresponded to our criteria. But given that a lot of people do have an interest in quality, um, I don't have a definition to, or a simple way to say this is a quality study, this is not a quality study. It's really, really hard if you actually try to put your finger on it. So we had a proxy. What we did was we separated out a sub-collection, papers which were published in prestige places. Now, prestige in our field means journals rather than book chapters, for example, or conference proceedings, and particularly journals which are cited frequently. So we simply went to the uh, JCR um, impact factor for 2019 for linguistics, okay? There's nothing to say that any individual paper that is published in, that in one of those journals is a good paper, a quality paper, and there's certainly nothing to say that a paper published elsewhere is not a quality paper. So it's only a proxy for quality, um, if that's uh, interesting for you, we'll see. And the fourth thing to do, as I said, was to make an actual corpus of the text themselves. So. That meant a certain amount of editing and then disregarding metadata, references, appendices, and so on. So we created first a, a corpus for the entire set of papers and then focusing on the conclusion sections. And we used ANCONC uh, as a simple tool to, uh, well, simple, an accessible tool to access that. Okay, so that's the methodology. Results and discussion, what do we find? Well, this is an ongoing collection that I have and I've talked about before, or published about before. In 2007, I had identified 39 uh, empirical studies of DDL. In 2012, 116, then 210, 351, and now 489, which looks like quite a lot, especially because it's printed front and back in most cases. Some of you may remember that uh, scene from Friends or multiple scenes from Friends, actually. So there's quite a lot to actually read. And we did read them with Nina. And um, this is what the publication outlook looks like over time. So you can see it's increasing nicely, which shows that the field is in a healthy situation. The dotted line is a, a three year smoothing. And this allowed us to identify our uh, time periods. So the first time period is quite long, um, 14 years, but the other ones are equal periods of four years, but not an equal number of studies in each period, okay? That's a subjective decision. It seemed to us to be the best answer, but there's no perfect answer to a question like this. That's what's what we chose. Where do they come from? Well, nearly three quarters of them were journal articles, especially from Recall with 28 um, publications, Call, LLT, and System. No others uh, published more than 10. And in fact, 135 cases, it's the only paper in our collection in a particular journal. The black line on this graph over time shows the, um, sorry, the red line shows the public number of papers published in the top 100 JCR journals. The black line is the rest. You can see they are both increasing, but there's a bit of an increase in the last period for the JCR journals, but a, an even much bigger increase um, going back to the 2008-11 period in other sources. So it seems to be a, a kind of a healthy um, distribution um, from that point of view. And there are a few others as well, uh, but not so many conference proceedings, chapters, and miscellaneous. 
Around the world, DDO was sometimes considered to be Eurocentric. And if you look here, yeah, in Europe, it was the, it was the biggest producer of DDO research in the first th uh, two periods, at least. Um, caught up and overtaken by publications in Asia and the Middle East. In the Americas, uh, there's not very much in South America. There is some, but especially North America, uh, USA and Canada, it's increasing nicely. Australasia, I don't know if that's the right word or if it should be Oceania or something else. And Africa, the numbers are so small as to not be uh, easy to interpret. Okay, but it seems to be in, in quite a lot of places around the world. This is the kind of thing which you can get just from coding the papers. So what situation, what institutions was the, was the studies conducted in? If you look at the three big blocks in the middle, they're all university, undergraduates, UG, postgraduates, PG, and uni is university either mixed or it doesn't specify what year they were in. In total, 85% of the studies, empirical studies we found in DDL were conducted with university students. Not many younger learners, school or pre-university, or other situations as well. What about professionals or post-university? We don't know very much about that. Which makes you think, well, okay, these are researchers, they're researching their own uh, students. And we know this is a problem, it's like psychology. Uh, most of, of what we know about psychology is conducted in North America by psychology professors working on their own psychology undergraduates. But then we kind of interpret that as being representative of people around the world. Well, not everybody might be similar to an American uh, undergraduate in a psychology degree. So it's a bit like the story of the drunk man looking for his uh, car keys near a lamppost because that's where the light is, even though he dropped them 10 meters away. You look where you can see something, which is not perhaps the most scientific thing that we could be doing. But anyway, we're looking where we have access. I said we created a corpus, so the whole corpus of all the papers came to a total of two and a half million tokens, and the subcorpus just of conclusion sections came to about a quarter of a million uh, tokens. And we looked at keywords and dividing those into periods, that's what the keywords look like for each of the blocks of time, but also uh, key engrams, so groups of words, which I haven't put here, um, specific periods, and this allowed us to divide up into four groups of um, themes which emerged from the conclusions corpus. So I won't go into that in detail. I'll just give you a few examples in the coming slides. So, for example, a lot of people identify as a limitation the small sample size that they have and say future studies should have more students. In fact, this is regularly mentioned in about a fifth of all conclusions. People say they didn't have enough students, they should have had more. Well, if you should have had more, you know in, when you start the study how many students you're going to have. If it's not enough, find some more or do a different study. That sounds cruel, but there are ways around it, as we shall see. Anyway, um, if calls for a larger sample size are frequent, do, is there any indication that sample size are, sizes are increasing? Well, not really. The JCR 100, that's kind of a U shape. It's higher in the last period, but that's partly because people tend to be using more than one experimental group and we didn't divide them up, we just put them together. But there's no real indication that sample sizes are getting, uh, are getting bigger. So if it is a big problem for research, that the samples are too small, why aren't we getting bigger sample sizes over time? For what it's worth, the mean group size was 30 to 42 in each period, and the median was 25. So this suggests, again, like the drunk man illustration, that we're just researching with our own students. It is a class size, it's convenient. Maybe we could research with more than one class, but okay. Um, so at the lower end, we have quite a lot of studies that are quite small, and that's justifiable. You can do useful case studies, even with only one or two students. But if you want something which is quantitative, where you have a statistical analysis, if you don't have enough students, then you lose power. So that is potentially a major problem. Duration was another problem which was identified frequently. This is just um, a snapshot of words like a duration and longitudinal. Um, the problem here is, is it's very difficult to actually get a clear picture because people measure duration in very different ways. Sometimes people talk about minutes or hours or sessions or weeks or semesters. But what does this mean? If you say the course lasted one semester, was it a 15 week semester or an eight week semester? Big difference. If it was eight weeks, was it every week or maybe only se se every second week? Makes a big difference. Was it one class every week or was it five classes a week? 
How long was the class? Was it half an hour or three hours? How much of the class time was given over to the target feature you're looking at, data-driven learning? So it's very, very difficult to say, but there's no real obvious trend that uh, duration is extending. And coupled with that, not many uh, studies, less than 10% had delayed post-test or 5% delayed questionnaires. So if we're thinking in terms of ecology, if you want to actually do something which is realistic, what really happens in class, we're not necessarily looking in the right places for that. The instruments, uh, most studies use more than one instrument. You can see here that uh, questionnaires and tests are the most frequent type. Questionnaires, especially for learners' attitudes and perceptions. And in fact, 53% of all the studies used a questionnaire, usually in conjunction with another um, type of instrument, also interviews and group discussions. When it comes to behavior, the most frequent tool was self-report after questionnaires, observations, but not very much on tracking, which of course begs the question, how reliable are questionnaires if you want to look at behavior, what students do? Maybe we should be doing more tracking. And finally, in terms of actual learning outcomes, uh, most people are using pre-post or control experimental tests here, sometimes looking at productions, but sometimes again, just using uh, questionnaires or other things. Language and skills, well, the skills you can see here that um, written skills dominate, 78% writing, followed by 14% each reading and tra translation. So most research studies in DDL have a focus on uh, written skills, more than speaking or listening. But also even within the written versus spoken, um, it's the productive skills which are more frequently looked at than the receptive skills. For the actual language, it's very difficult because the boundaries are not absolutely hard and fast between vocabulary and lexical grammar and discourse, but there is a clear dominance of lexical grammar, then vocabulary, and only after that discourse. But what can we deduce from this? Is this because if we don't have more studies on listening and speaking, or if we don't have more studies on discourse, is it because DDL is not good for that? Maybe people have tried it, it didn't work, and they didn't publish. Or maybe they just didn't try in advance at all because they knew it wouldn't work, or they were convinced it wouldn't work. Maybe it would work, but we don't have the resources. Maybe we don't have appropriate tools to look at discourse. Maybe we don't have the right corpora for speaking and listening. It's a possibility. Maybe it's just that we lack imagination. Maybe we're just doing what similar other people have done in the past, doing similar things again. Maybe we could be a bit more imaginative, but all we can actually say with certainty is these studies are very few and far between on spoken skills or discourse and pragmatics, for example. Um, corpus size. Uh, this is a logarithmic scale. So the first group is from 1,000 to 9,999. The second band is from 10,000 to uh, 99,999 tokens. In all of the first um, six groups, you can see the number of studies in each band is decreasing. Okay, so there are fewer and fewer small corpora being used um, as time goes by. With the exception of the top bands, studies which involve a corpus, which is 100 million words or more, they're increasing, largely because people now have access, easy, free or cheap access to these corpora with things like Sketch Engine, or particularly um, Mark Davies, uh, used to be BYU, now it's English hyphen corpora. Um, not many studies yet using billion word corpora, although they will come. Um, this is only up to 2019, remember, there have been a couple more since then. Um, but at the lower end of the scale, there might be reasons for preferring very small corpora. You might like, for example, I mean, the smallest one we found was um, Barbara Seidelhofer. She had a group of 20 students and she gave them a text to read and asked each of them to write a 60 word summary. And then she put that together to make a corpus. Now, is 1,200 words, is that a corpus for you? Well, she was using corpus tools and techniques to analyze it and her students were. So to me, as I said, with a broad definition of DDL, this would count as a corpus, and I'm quite happy to include that here. Which corpora? Um, the big band in the middle that you can see is self-built corpora, um, but this is decreasing over time. Very often it is research articles, academic, you can see another large-ish block there. Um, but otherwise, a lot of the uh, most popular individual corpora are COCA, Corpus of Contemporary American English, and the BNC, the British National Corpus, each has its advantages and its disadvantages, of course. What's interesting, perhaps, is to see what's not there very much. For example, parallel corpora. 
Now, if one of the potential objections to data-driven learning is it's difficult for learners to get to grips with authentic language, maybe using a parallel corpus, in other words, where you have text in the target language and the translation in the student's first language, could be a useful way to attenuate at least the difficulty of corpora and to identify the differences between the mother tongue and the target language. Learner corpora, again, identifying the gap between your own individual language or your peer's language and the target, but they've been very underused. Very few studies have actually tried to do DDL involving a learner corpora. Multimodal corpora, very few of those, in other words, spoken or video corpora, could be really useful. And in, in that group, I've included uh, corpora of transcription, spoken language. Self-compile corpora. Now, if students know how to create their own corpus, then when they go out into the world of work or continued education, if they can download, if they can create their own corpus of research articles in their field or emails from their company or their company's literature or their clients' uh, documents, that could be a re really useful source if they know how to create their own corpora, but they're not taught how to do that very often. Graded corpora, in other words, simplified text. Now, a lot of people say, oh, that can't count as a corpus because it's not authentic. But the things that learners can do with a, a corpus of graded readers is exactly the same as with other areas of DDL. And again, it could be one way of making it more accessible at lower levels. Corpora of manuals, in other words, the actual textbooks which students use, whether it's in language or in psychology, sociology, engineering, whatever, if they're actually looking at a corpus of text which are relevant for them, because that's what they're supposed to read, that could be useful. And sketch engine for language learning, um, lots of stuff in there, not many studies yet. So you can see there are lots of things we are doing, but there are lots of things that we aren't doing so much as well. Just a couple more points in this part of the paper. One is there are frequent calls for, or rather people saying that guidance and scaffolding and training is really, really important. But there are only a couple of papers we, which actually specifically target training or guidance or scaffolding as the paper, in, as the, the object of the paper itself. It's mentioned that these types of words occur in 210 of our 489 papers in the conclusion sections. But if it's important, then you would expect a study to compare training versus no training or one type of training against another type of training, or training at this point against training at a different point of time. But that, there are almost none which do that, literally one or two. And the final section here is the word theory, because it has been claimed that DDL lacks a theoretical underpinning. So this is just what the ANCONC interface looks like. It's looking at theor so theory, theories, theorization, theoretical, et cetera. Um, 70 occurrences in total. Um, in not so many papers, in 50 papers, I think. Um, this is the conclusion section which mentioned theory the most often. It's Dolgova and Muller, 20, 2019. And they say, future investigations of corporate tools and techniques can benefit from more theory-driven approaches, relying on specific linguistic theories and theories of language acquisition, such as sociocultural theory, discourse theories, and so on, complementing technology-enhanced instruction with a systematic and theory-driven approach to language instruction. OK, so they mentioned it six times, but no other paper met, had the word or the root theory more than three times. And that was rare. Um, so it's not very, there's only about 50 conclusion sections which even mention theory at all out of nearly 500 papers, so just over 10 percent. So with the small numbers, it's very difficult to generalize. We did find some indication that the early papers would make mention of generativist theories. They're moving on to constructivist theories and sociocultural theories th later on. But the numbers are so small, it's very difficult to generalize. It's just bits and pieces here and there. But that's not necessarily specific to data-driven learning. As Yazdan Chupsas, he's doing a, um, his PhD uh, looking at four journals in CUL, computer-assisted language learning. And he comes to very similar conclusions. The theory is very much a subsidiary. We don't talk about it very much in empirical studies. For DDL, this confirms what Pascual Perez Paredes found a couple of years ago in his uh, paper in Call, the journal, that very few DDL studies explicitly mention theory. Um, partly you'd expect that because they are empirical papers, but, and I would agree with him and with Anne O'Keefe, that there is room for more input from theory, not to constrain what you do. I don't think we should ever say the theory says we can't do it, therefore we don't look at it but it might give us ideas for new types of research to inform the research. And maybe we could actually use the empirical studies to test theories. 
could be quite fun to do. So I think there's room for more theoretical stuff in there. Okay, so conclusion section. Um, I've got another section after this, but conclusions first. What do I have to say so far? Well, I'm going to go beyond the data here. The study which I've been talking about was with Nina Biakina, but with uh, Peter, as I said earlier, we, um, uh, we, we wrote a chapter trying to be a little bit uh, provocative or polemical, titled DDL is Dead, Long Live DDL. And this was in the book, well, it should be coming out soonish in a book edited by Henry Tyne and others. Um, and if I can give a short commercial break here, this chapter with uh, Peter Crossway came from the last TALC conference. TALC is Teaching and Language Corpora, which was last year in Perpignan, in the south of France. It's every two years. Next year, um, TALC 2022 will be in Ireland at the University of Limerick, co-organized by Fiona Farr, Anna Keefe and Angela Chambers. You've got the link there. Otherwise, if you Google Talc Limerick 2022, you should find the call for papers there. So if you're interested in this, come to Limerick next year. It'd be nice to see you there. <coughs> so I'm going beyond what the study says here and deliberately trying to be a little bit provocative as well. The first thing I would say is that for data-driven learning, there's a lot of research out there. Well, a lot is a subjective term. To me, it seems like a lot. You might think it's nothing. But 489 papers in 31 years, it's so much that you can't expect most researchers to know all of that. Even if they do go out and collect it all, you won't read 500 papers um, very quickly. It takes a long time. So when people say things in the introduction to their paper, no study has ever done this before in the history of the universe. Either they have a really, really tiny focal point, or it has been done before, they just don't know it, or maybe they're a genius. It's a possibility. Certainly, if you only look at research published in the top prestigious, well-known journals, they don't give you the whole picture. Um, you'd be missing out on about three quarters of all DDL studies if you only look at prestige journals. Mm. But because you can't know it all, the impression, and this is again an impression, is a lot of the research in DDL is quite repetitive. It's doing the same thing again and again, reinventing the wheel, but without being a proper replication study. So that's the first thing I would say about the quantity and type of research. Second thing on the actual studies themselves, the reporting practices are poor and they're inconsistent. We had the example of duration. Um, another example is proficiency. A lot of studies don't tell you what level the learners were at. Sometimes they just say intermediate. How do you know? What does intermediate mean to you? Is it the same as what it means to me or some other paper I want to compare it to? We need to improve our reporting practices. Quantitative studies tend to be insufficiently robust in terms of power, they're not big enough. Um, and there are many other types of analyses which are simply missing, like there's very, very few multifactorial analyses. Qualitative studies have their own problems. They're often overly subjective. Very often they will say, here's an example from an interview with a student of what they thought, but how, what does that example tell us? Was this the only example just from one student or was it representative of a lot of students? We just don't know, just simply giving an example doesn't tell you very much. And you would think that people publishing anything related to corpus linguistics would know that an example doesn't tell you anything. You need lots of examples or to at least say it's, it's typical. Um, similarly with questionnaires, can we really rely on questionnaires for some things? Wouldn't it be better to use tracking, for example? And in general, a lack of mixed methods, genuine mixed methods, which doesn't mean just having a quantitative study and then putting a questionnaire on the end, but actually looking at the same data using different instruments the analysis. Replication studies would be nice. A lot of this is purely logistics. Um, we're constrained by logistics. It would be nice to have longer um, sessions looking at DDL, but we have our class, it lasts one semester. <clears throat> Delayed tests, well once the semester's over it's very difficult to get results, to get reports back from learners. But if we could be a bit more ecological, especially looking at what learners do outside class, because what they do in class is quite limited. But if we hope that they're going to carry on using DDL in the future, then what they're doing outside class between two classes is really important. And also, of course, after the end of the course, is it taken up by a significant, a substantial enough group of students? It would be nice to know. And of course, looking at other languages, other populations, larger samples, as we've said. <clears throat> but this is largely because we have the teacher as researcher. In other words, the person who publishes the paper 
and does the research is also teaching. So you go into your own class, you do your own research, and you write up the paper. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, nearly all researchers in applied linguistics do teach. Researchers are teachers. But very few teachers of language are also researchers. So the people who we're reading and taking as indicative are actually a minority population, it's a minority practice. There's nothing to say, maybe researchers can do something really well. Does that mean that ordinary teachers, i.e. teachers who are not paid to do research, who don't have time to do formal research, would they come to similar conclusions? Would they get the same benefits from it or not? So we need to collaborate with each other, but also with teachers. And if we could do this, this will allow us to collaborate with different, uh, between different levels. Maybe you could have the same uh, target questions, but looking at learners of different levels of proficiency. Or in different courses, maybe some in an engineering school and some in a law school. Maybe for different languages, try to use the same DDL approach, sometimes for English, sometimes for Italian, some Spanish, um, or other languages as well, Chinese, Japanese, and compare actually in the same study what's happening there, rather than trying to compare two different studies. Between institutions in the same country or in different countries, there's so much that we could be doing. So just saying, oh, we only had a small sample student, we need more, and nobody doing more, there are ways to get larger samples of students. I think we also need to go on further than the basic questions, does it work and do they like it, and look at variation, particularly by comparing not an experimental group and a control group, but two experimental groups, or three or four. Um, maybe they are from different institutions, or maybe some of them are in engineering, some of them are in medicine, but maybe they're using a different corpus, but doing the same things with it. Or maybe it's the same corpus using different tools. Can we say that Sketch Engine is better than uh, LexTutor, for example? Um, maybe look, looking, comparing, doing the same type of thing but with different language items, or different learner profiles, with different amount of training. All of these different things that we can do that we integrate into our classes, we could be doing differently and a bit more imaginatively. Most of these criticisms are not exclusive to DDL. Okay, they apply to applied, much of applied linguistics and particularly to cool computer assisted language learning. And it's something which John Gillespie um, found in his uh, survey of four call journals, which he published last year, is that call studies tend to be con conducted over a short period, or infrequently, and they are preliminary. Now, we had over a hundred of the papers uh, in our collection mentioned the word pilot or preliminary talking about themselves. If you're going to do a pilot study, it means you're going to do a major study later, but it doesn't happen. What they mean is this is just a small scale study, it's not very formal and it's not really very good, which is sad, you're underselling yourself. If it really is a preliminary study or a pilot study, there should be another study coming along later. Okay. Um, evolving at a small number of students at particular levels at a single institution, as we've seen, there are ways that we can go beyond this. And we really ought to be going beyond this. So those are general criticisms we might make in relation to um, uh, call in general. Specifically in terms of DDL, we have got over time more and more tools, better tools with more functions, they're more user friendly. But a lot of the studies which you actually read today look very similar to studies published 10, 20, 30 years ago. The focus on concordances and frequency lists, but there's very little in other areas, other types of interaction. One obvious candidate is more, is can you do DDL on a mobile phone? There's very, very little on this. How would concordances and frequency lists look on a mobile phone? We do have tools which work with that, but we don't have studies of it. Similarly with corpora, we do over time have more and more corpora, bigger and bigger corpora, and in many ways better corpora, but not always better in every respect. In particular, they tend to be very similar to previous corpora, um, but they're just bigger, or they're in a particular specific niche, which we don't have other ones for um, elsewhere, but they're not necessarily more relevant. It might be more relevant to have corpora, which are specifically parallel corpora, graded corpora, self-compiled corpora, multimodal corpora, that leads on to something we're going to be hearing about next week and so on. Final little comment here. This is something which I wrote um, 10 years ago, just about, um, one of my surveys of DDL, that there is a dearth of studies looking at the major advantages that are generally attributed to DDL. So if we come back to the um, buzzwords, which you had earlier, 
all of these, when you have a paper on DDL, it says, oh, it's really good because this, 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 this. And then they do a study and they say, oh, it works. Therefore, this must have been involved. But it's a very indirect kind of look. Maybe we should be looking more directly. For example, at cognitive processing. Does the fact that you have an extensive experience of DDL, does it change the way that you go about processing language? Does it actually make you more sensitive to language? Actually looking directly at language awareness and DDL, not just saying DDL works, therefore it must be the case, but really focusing on that. DDL leads to late, greater learner autonomy. Does it? Where's the evidence for that? DDL improves learning to learn. Let's actually do a study or several studies, preferably looking at that. In other words, data driven learning, which is claimed to be quite time consuming at the beginning, we need to be looking at longer term benefits. Does it actually really lead to better learning, not just more learning, but better learning, different types of learning, and perhaps even better learners? It'd be nice to think so. And this could be where uh, theory comes in because it's really tricky to imagine this type of thing. And um, we do need to get imaginative with it. And maybe we could draw more inspiration. I won't say what, that's up to individuals designing their studies to think about. Maybe we could draw more on theory as a way to give us new ideas for, the res for research, whether it's from a constructivist or noticing or a sociocultural theory paradigm, and also cross-fertilizing from other fields. So looking at what happens in psychology or sociology and education, that could be a way to give us a new boost in data-driven learning or call or other fields as well. So to summarize the summary, to infinity and beyond. Thank you, Buzz, for that stimulating little uh, look there. For data-driven learning, board, whatever your specific field of applied linguistics or call, there is more research than you think that's been published. Okay, if you really look carefully, you will find probably a lot more than you thought. There are so many ways that we could be doing research better. We could actually doing, be doing really doing better research and writing it up better. But conceptually, scientifically, there's lots of boundary pushing we can do, not just doing the same things other people have done, but trying to get a new input on that. Okay, that's 44 minutes. I've got a, a final section, which is about 10 minutes long, if you agree. Um, trying to look at some perhaps more accessible, but less usual examples for the twilight zone of DDL. Is that okay, Peter? Yeah, it's your time. Okay, let's carry on a little bit. Just to give you examples of what I'm thinking about. If you have, for example, a web page like Wikipedia or any electronic document, control F or search, you have a word which intrigues you, does it occur elsewhere in the document? Okay, this is a, a, a one electronic page from Wikipedia is not a corpus, control F search is not a concordance. But what you're doing here just by searching for a word is you can see repeated occurrences in an individual text which are highlighted in color. So if you, for example, this Wikipedia page from the Common European Framework of Reference for Language, if you search for communicate, you get communication, but then you get communicative competences, communicative competences. You can see three or four occurrences and you can see general and particular which precede them and how they're used in context. So it's the basic idea of DDL is drawing attention to repetitions and looking at how they're used in context. Just by highlighting them and seeing them in a text, that can, it's the same basic philosophy. Oops, excuse me, been the wrong way there. Um, Google is not a concordancer and the internet is not a corpus, but you can do some useful things with Google. I suspect strongly that many students do use Google for language learning purposes. This is a couple of examples in French. A colleague of mine who's not a native French speaker, she wrote a paper in French. A couple of things which I noticed, she wrote les premiers dix, literally the first 10, okay? If you Google that in inverted commas to make sure that Google looks for this and exactly this and nothing else, otherwise Google thinks it knows better than you and it interprets your request. No, inverted commas means exactly this. You get 16,600 results. If you change the word order, which is my intuition, les dix premiers, literally the 10 first, you get 500,000. So comparing 16,000 to 500,000, it seems like les dix premiers is probably going to be the better choice just from frequency. Okay, Google has its own problems. Another example was the same person wrote avoir pour l'objectif, literally have for the objective, in other words, aims, aims to. 
I found seven results in inverted commas with Google, but everyone put objectif again over half a million. Where you have to be a little bit careful is Google is only estimating the number of results. If you go to, if you look at how many pages there are, there are only 13 pages of hits for avoir pour objectif, and there are only 10 on a page, which means that Google only actually has 130 examples, but is estimating 500,000. So you need to be careful with Google, but if students are doing it anyway, maybe we could help them do it a little bit better. And that I think is a useful thing to do. And it's DDL-like. It's using an interface to access text. Another example, I've used this many times before, a student writing play an important role. French students tend to overuse the word important. What other word could you use? Well, you can go to a thesaurus and just look up synonyms for important, but are they appropriate in this context? Now, if you do a Google advanced search, using the inverted commas, but other things as well, other filters you can use, play a asterisk role in, what word, it's the only wild card which works with uh, Google, what word can occur in that position? And if you look at some examples, so play a uh, asterisk role in, examples of what you, found, what you find, I haven't edited this at all, you find key role, critical role, significant role, large role, critical a second time, key role a second time. It doesn't give you the answer, but it gives you suggestions which you might follow up and then before you make your decision. So don't trust Google 100%, but it can be useful in a very DDL-like way. Um, similarly, lingui and reverso context, they are not corpora, uh, and it's not concordance as such, but it's pretty similar. It's collections of parallel texts. In other words, real translations, allegedly, not machine translations. You can only find things which are actually in the collection of texts, not to call it a corpus, but it works well on a mobile phone. For example, how do you say mistakenly in, in French? If the students know, okay, mistake, mistaken, mistakenly, mistake in French is probably erreur, is the obvious equivalent, but there's no single word, adverb, erreurement or something like that, it doesn't exist, but you can see various options. It doesn't tell you the right one, but after, is quite frequent there. So a lot of my students, they know lingui, but they only know it for the dictionary part. They don't go further down. We could use, do reasonable things with that, similar to DDL. Hypercollocation is about the simplest tool you can possibly imagine. It's a dictionary based on archive text, so it's scientific text. You type in a word like criticized, and you ask for the, previous, the next the following word or the previous word. So if you type in criticized, click previous, it shows you what words occur frequently before criticized. So you've got be and was, not very helpful. You got heavily or strongly criticized or widely criticized. If you click on the word, you can see a number of examples in context. This could be really useful for collocations, um, appropriate in academic context. Last week, we had a talk by Anna Frank Berg Garcia talking about collocade, a tool which helps you with writing and collocations. You start to type, Advantages underlined, so it gives you examples, if you click on it, of adjective plus advantage, and several examples, maybe it's obvious advantage, you think is perhaps the right thing, click on it again, and you see some examples of that in context. So there are tools which do a very DDL-like thing here, but you don't need to know about what a corpus is, how a concordance works, and so on. If you do, if you want to be a little bit more ambitious, it's not difficult to create a discipline-specific corpus, a tool like and core gem from Lawrence Anthony. You can go to subfields and sub subfields and sub subfields. These are all things which are taken from Web of Science. Um, and you can build your own corpus in a relatively specific field quite quickly for your learners. It won't be 100% appropriate, but it's maybe easier than going out and individually combine, compiling and converting lots of texts. If you want something which isn't necessarily academic, there's Bootcat. Bootcat. The idea is you think of words which are specific to your field, to the corpus you want to create, you put them in, and then it creates so just five, six words. It creates triplets, random groupings of three of these words, and finds text which include those three words, and it creates your an almost instant corpus of you know, 10, 20,000 words in a minute. And then you can do an iterative process. If you look at the keywords, what's specific to your corpus compared to another, you can do that again and again and again. There's an automatic function in Sketch Engine for that um, if you have an account. So it's not necessarily difficult to create a corpus, but maybe a corpus isn't what we want. Maybe just a text, for example, extensive reading. People are always touting the virtues of extensive reading. 
Um, although there are occasional lone voices against it. For example, if you want your students to read Alice in Wonderland, you start to read Alice in Wonderland. On the first page, you have this word hurried. Ooh, what do you do with that? Well, Alice in Wonderland, you can download an electronic version from Gutenberg, stick it into a concordance like AntConc. If you're doing simple things with AntConc, it takes you maybe 10 minutes to, to or 30 minutes to discover maximum. You can do simple things with AntConc very, very quickly. So you can download it um, in TXT format and explore it almost immediately. Just click on word list, go. It shows you all the words in the corpus. And you can see if you go down, if you look for hurried and hurry, you can see them here um, at this point here, 11 occurrences of each. What are the occurrences? Well, if you um, just go back to the concordance page, type in hurry, you can see hurry in this book. So it's not giving you corpus examples which are representative of some wide area of the English language. It's in this book. Now, in this book, the word hurry is always a noun. It's always in the structure, in, determiner, hurry. Sometimes with an optional adjective. If there's an adjective, it's great. It doesn't mean that no other adjective is possible. It doesn't mean it has to be a noun in this structure, but in this book, and if you want to read this book, you can see all of these examples coming up. It's the same structure every time. And the fact that you can see the structure that allows you to focus on what's useful to help you read this book. Similarly with hurried, if you look at hurried and you sort to the right, you can see the following word in every case is a preposition or adverb particle. Okay, hurried back, hurried by, hurried off, with two exceptions, line three, a hurried manner, and line 11, a hurried tone. It's used adjectivally. Okay, so it helps you with reading this book. That could be a really useful thing. Like I mentioned with course books, your English course books, if you can look at all the occurrences of a target word in your course book, here in a, a novel, that could be useful in helping you with the language you're specifically uh, required to look at. Um, 53 minutes going quickly. Coca is not just Coca, Corpus of Contemporary American English. If you go into Coca, there's this little button you can see at the top here. It looks like a page of text. If you go into there, um, you can then input a text. If you don't have an account, you're limited. I do have an account, but I use a limited version. So putting in the first 400 words of Alice in Wonderland, all the words in blue are words which are among the 500 most frequent words in English. In other words, words which your learners almost certainly know. They may not know them well, but they know them. The words in yellow are part of the top 3,000, the most 3,000 most frequent words for English. Um, then you have words, uh, sorry, it's the words in green. The words are yellow are words which are less frequent, and gray is off list, which normally means it includes a capital letter, okay, as a default system. And you can see the word list. So this can help you decide, is this text appropriate for my learners, whether it's a book or a newspaper article? Is it too difficult for them? Because I'm teaching in, Fr in France, where they have a Romance language background, English has so much vocabulary shared with French that my criteria will be different from yours, but you can decide in your context. That could be a useful thing to decide if it's appropriate. Maybe there are some words which occur frequently. You can see the frequency on the right, um, some words which is worth pre-teaching. Um, and again, you can see multiple examples in the book itself. If you click on an individual word, so this is still from Alice in Wonderland, this is all the information you can get from this same function of COCA. You can see, excuse me, the distribution in different registers at the top here, whether it's in blogs or web, uh, TVs, movies, spoken fiction, and so on. Gives you a definition, gives you links outside to Google, reverse lingui, but also to Euglish and play phrase I'll mention in a moment. It gives you synonyms, it gives you topics associated with them, uh, the kind of collocates uh, that occur, related words, um, so from family, the same root, clusters, uh, corpora where you can maybe want to click on that. And of course, the concordance lines at the bottom. This is all from one interface. You don't need to know about corpora. If you spend 10 minutes exploring this with your learners, they'll get it. They do, honestly. Um, that's just with uh, one tool for one language. But something like Voyant Tools doesn't care about language. Again, you put in the first chapter or maybe the whole book of Alice in Wonderland, and you can see, you can visualize quite quickly, what are the frequent words? Which ones do you maybe need to pre-teach? Here, I've taken Alice au Pays de Merveille, so it's in French. 
So if you want to teach early Singapore Pei Di Merve, uh, you can. Um, the middle, they call it a cup, which is actually a bunch of grapes, not a grape itself. You, again, you can different visualization of frequent um, terms. You can you can see groups of words at the bottom, which include um, so that the frequent uh, engrams and a little um, concordance like presentation of individual words on the right. Lex Tutor from Tom Cobb deserves a mention, not because it's very pretty, and Tom will hate me for saying this, but he knows it, people have told him often enough, he doesn't care, but it's got some really useful tools, such as a vocab profile, like we just saw, but also graded readers, a corpus of graded readers, or Disney scripts, or Law, or Dr. House, there are so many individual corpora in there, which could be useful for your learners. Um, we talked about speech, spoken language, tools like my case which you don't hear but you can see and you can choose according to the speaker what age group what discipline what uh, role do they have in the speech that's potentially really useful for learners who are going to study an american university for example but some spoken corpora is actually a speech corpora in other words you can hear you can access the sound as well most of you probably know ted ideas worth shed uh, spreading shedding spreading this was a tool created a, a, parallel tool created by Yoshiri Hasebe. Um, so he took all the TED uh, texts and he created his own tool. So you can input an expression like, and by the way, and if you do that, it then takes you to all the occurrences. You can see how similar this is to a concordance. And if you click on one of them, it takes you to that specific place and you can click on it and listen to it. How useful is that for the spoken language? Similarly, Yuglish, Uglish is obviously a play on YouTube and English, but it's not just for English. You have other languages. You can change the language at the top here. You put, it, you put in an expression like what the hell, and you, it takes you straight to a video extract, and you can see the text at the bottom. You can go to the next one, and the next one, and the next one. Now, the specificity of Uglish is it's gone onto YouTube, and it's downloaded uh, lots and lots of videos, which are subtitled, so it can take you straight to that place. OK, now you might not want to use YouTube because it's too varied, but the other tools like Play Phrase, uh, which I mentioned uh, briefly earlier, Play Phrase is the same basic idea, but it doesn't use YouTube. It uses subtitled films and TV series. Again, not just for English. You can look in other languages as well. So if you type in an expression like give me a break, um, you can go there and sometimes you can recognize the actors. If you know the film Lethal Weapon, you can see Mel Gibson and Danny Glover and you've got up to five occurrences in a row, which you can listen to one after the other. So some useful stuff going on here. So there really are lots and lots of ideas. I've been almost an hour now. There are loads of self-help books out there for teachers and even for learners, which can tell you what to do and how to do it. These are th so the covers of some, three recent ones by Pascual Perez Paredes, uh, Tatiana Karpenko II. And this one on the right is an edited volume, but it's an ebook, which is free. Uh, co edited by or edited by Ellen LaFolle. So there's stuff which actually interacts directly um, with some of the corpora. So some useful stuff going on there. But it's not because these texts exist that you should be dogmatic. I try to be as open as possible when it comes to data driven learning. Particularly, don't just copy what other people do. If you're going to use any of the tools or techniques, adopt them, but adapt them, whether it's for your students in your teaching, for you as a language learner or as a marker. For example, if I have to mark English uh, text for the language, often I hesitate, do we say that or not? I go to a corpus. If I'm writing something in French, I'm not a French speaker, I can use a corpus French for me and for research as well. So don't be dogmatic. A couple of corny cliches, we need to push the envelope, don't be stationary. I can just hear the groans around the world there. Think outside the box, don't be Schrodinger's cat. That's not my cat, but I haven't got a nice picture of her in a box. So to coin another phrase, just do it, but do it your way. And that's me finished. 60 minutes, 43 seconds. Sorry, a little bit long. Well, again. thanks very much, Alex. Um, again, I think a really inspiring talk kind of problematizes what is currently there and what we need to do. And uh, I think the, the demonstration of the various tools there at the final part of the talk was also incredibly useful. Some tools that I haven't heard of myself that I would really like to try. So thanks so much for that. And I'm sure that the audience are 
super appreciative. I can see now that the congratulations are coming through in the <laughs> chat. Very kind of you, thank you. That's the way it goes. So uh, just very briefly uh, introduce the final talk for this 2021 period in this seminar series. Um, we have Dr. Well, Professor Tony Berber Sardinia from uh, the Pontifical Catholic University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. And I see that he has uh, been in a number of these talks already as, um, as a participant. And he's also uh, organized a number of seminar series uh, for, on a, of his own as well. And he's going to be looking at multimodal corpora in corpus linguistics and there will be a section in that talk regarding how these can be used for the purposes of language learning and teaching so we're very excited for that but it will not be the last seminar in this series we plan to go into 2022 with a new round of speakers in january so do look out for further information about that nearer the time but for now again if we could uh give our thanks to alex for his talk and then um, however you choose to do that again just try to monitor the chat i guess and um what we will do now is to stop the recording at this point and to head into some of the questions that um i've collected from the audience so We'll stop the recording here and thanks again to Alex for your presentation today.